Hi, my name is Corey Williams, and I'm here with the Fayetteville Public Library, and I'm glad that you all could join us virtually this evening. Uh, during the program, I'll be monitor monitoring the comments on the stream, so if you have any questions for our poet this evening, um, if you just ask them in the comments, then I'll be sure to ask her for you. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome Suzanne Underwood Rhodes. She is a poet, author, and teacher who moved to Fayetteville from Virginia Beach, Virginia. And she's the author of several books of poetry and lyrical prose. Tonight she'll be reading from her second full-length collection, Flying Yellow, that was just released by Paraclet, Paraclete Press. Her poems have been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and have won several awards. Her poems and essays appear regularly in journals, books, and anthologies. And she has taught workshops here at the library and virtual workshops through the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute and through the Muse Writers Center in Norfolk, Virginia. She taught, she taught English and creative writing at King University, Old Dominion University, and other colleges for many years. She serves as a parliamentarian of the Poets Roundtable of Arkansas and is the guest speaker for their annual spring celebration later this month. Her collection, Flying Yellow, that she'll be reading from tonight is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and through Paraclete Press. And if you'll virtually join me in welcoming Miss Rhodes. Thank you, Corey, for the lovely introduction. And thank you all out there in <laughs> Cyberland for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to read from our beautiful library here in Fayetteville. Today uh, is, um, this month is National Poetry Month, uh, as you probably know. And this year marks the 25th anniversary of the National Poetry Month. A friend sent me an article today that appears in the New York Times by Margaret Rankle, who writes, we are a species in love with beauty. Thank God for the poets. Their words remind us that suffering is not our only birthright. Life is also our birthright, life and love and beauty. This sets a really nice backdrop for my reading tonight, for my poems face both the abyss and the brightness. My subjects range from family members and family matters to interesting characters, both real and imagined, then to the natural world of creatures and landscapes and to more direct religious experience of my Christian faith. I think it's fair to say that spiritual light binds most of my poems together, that and the musicality of language. The first two poems I'm going to read are about my mother and my hero, Mary Lee Haynes. She was a published writer, a singer in grocery, <laughs> grocery store aisles, an intelligent and independent thinker, the best friend of many and a stunning beauty. To show my deep connection to her, I'm going to read from my new book, How the Dress Lived. <clears throat> the creative mind plays with the objects it loves, Carl Jung said, that's an epigraph for the poem. Like my mother, I unmade clothes to make them. It was a war between rules and resistance to see how far we could get before conceding in the face of the wrong pocket to the pattern's authority. For us, the making was all in the feeling, the sewing from senses. I'd pin my moth-thin pattern to the fabric cut from a big starchy bolt that landed with a thump on the counter. The sales girl in glasses with a head for math unrolled the reams of cloth and snipped my yards and a half with her expert scissors its bite releasing denim's blue stiffness, organza's gauzy pools. And then to go home and lay out my fabric, seeing myself as the butterick girl sketched with goddess curves in the dress I was sewing in colors of gold or teal to complement my hair. To set up the singer with its pinpoint light, work the pedal, train the spool's thread to the bobbin, thrumming ever faster as I thought of my dress, how gorgeous I'd be like the girls at school in stylish clothes from Garfinkel's. No prettier, Mom would say, as she stood me on a chair to rehem a skirt, trusting her eye, not the tape measure, with straight pins like defiant little spears between her lips as she tucked and tugged, nodding yes to the girl of her birthing cut from her own unruly swath 
to suit the shapes, dreams, colors of her mind. And the second poem that I'm going to read is called My Mother Haunts the Thrift Store. Now let me tell you a little bit about her. She grew up in rural northern Alabama on a farm during the Great Depression. And she was an exceptional student. She was the valedictorian of her class. And um, she was offered a full scholarship to the University of Alabama, which she turned down because she wanted to help her family financially. Uh, well, at that time, the FBI was going around the country to recruit uh, people to come and work there. And so she uh, took that chance and, <clears throat> excuse me, she um, worked for the FBI, moved to Washington, D.C., and she left her farm girl ways, except she still had a fondness for, um, what do you call those? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, she had a fondness for buttermilk and pork rinds. That was what I was trying to think of. Um, she had three daughters, including me, a husband who left her for someone else, and a second husband who was emotionally damaged and abusive. After he died, she married uh, years later at age 78, and he was 88. So this is my mother haunts the thrift store. When I saw the glint of her French hoop earrings as she lighted the steps of the bus taking her downtown to a job that stoked my stepfather's ire, her ponytail high and swinging, the envy of the other office girls, saw the ghost of those hoops in the cracked display case of pop beads and bangles, and the same cloisonné heart given her by my sister who sleeps far away but weeps in faded pages of my mother's journal. And then down the aisles, rack after rack, the coral, the aqua, the striking white on black, color was her flair, her strong opinions shaming pale shirts of thought, but oh, what heads she turned with those colors. When I passed the books packed tight on sinking shelves and spied among the hot-throated covers of cheap paperbacks, biographies of John Adams and Charlemagne, a King James Bible, Truman Capote novels following her through many moves and two dead husbands to feed her restless mind. The mind that fed me too, all the way back to gypsies and poets singing in books she read to me in sheltered spaces. When I came to the shoes, high heels announcing her long shapely legs, those suede shoes I longingly brushed as she dressed for an evening out the complex glamour of her French twist and mystical air of Chanel No. 5, the sorrow of her true red lipstick. All this transfixed me with the force of a dream I still reach for, and even the linens, the sheets and spreads bleached clean of love and death, speak of her body so present in everything given away. I grew up in Arlington, Virginia in the 60s when a lot of things were going on in the world and in my home. Uh, to give you an idea of what that was like, I'm going to read a prose poem called um, Cold War Nerves. <clears throat> Mrs. Mirza, our Orthodox babysitter from Lithuania, lived on the corner of Ninth and Livingston and was what you'd call ample bosomed. Clichés have their uses, and ample bosom was needed to quell the anxiety of a child growing up in the Cold War, seeking the comfort of a grandmother figure, which is why I would walk to her house and soak up the strangeness of cabbage smells and her thick accent, thick like the slices of pumpernickel bread on her kitchen table where we'd sit and eat, talking like old friends. Her house was one of hundreds in Dominion Hills, all two-story brick built after the war with variations only in the shutters. Ours were green and belonged to Mr. Morse, the landlord, who had no idea of when, what went on in his house until the night he came for dinner and watched the puppet show my sisters and I put on for entertainment. With bickering so authentic, our parents went white in the face, even whiter than they were. And that's another thing about Dominion Hills. It's where white flight landed from D.C. And why, seeing the demographics, George Lincoln Rockwell and his stormtroopers set up headquarters right across the highway in a farmhouse and went up to Crown Heights to open their terrifying trench coats and show their screaming, twisted crosses to a crowd of Jews so you can see why everyone was always on edge, but none more than my stepfather, who calmed himself each night with tequila and jazz because of all the secrets 
secret stumping inside his head, property of the CIA. I guess they owned us too, because try as we might to escape, and my mother left three times, they always found us and returned us to our house on 9th Street North. In sixth grade, walking home from school with talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis ringing in my ears, and after I'd only just knelt behind Andrew Timotheo with my hands behind my head and the stench of his shoes in my face as we performed our drill, I knew the world was coming to an end. If it weren't for Mrs. Mirza sharing bread with me under the peace of her sing-song blessing, I might have turned out wilder than I was starting to become, maybe doomed. Who knows what pull of grace abides in a person who escaped a homeland of millions murdered but never spoke of it. Not even when I asked who the faded faces were in the photos on her mantle, just mama and mother and little girl is me. Eventually the era calmed down and the next genocide hadn't yet happened. But I searched out the story of Mrs. Mirza's people and how their bodies were stacked in frozen camps and cattle cars in the name of war's cliches. Blood and honor, death or freedom, peace to the world. So yes, my poems face the abyss, those dark forces of a fallen world and the sorrows of my own life. The next poem I'm going to read is called Caric Caricaturist about my stepfather who worked as an artist for the CIA. He also was very good at drawing caricatures. My first death, I was riding in the back seat of the Buick Special, studying my stepfather's neck with its stitchwork of lines, when over the wind's rush from the downed windows, he announced, Bill Fetters is dead. My comic book slid from my lap because all I could think of was Mr. Fetter sticking his hand in that fan at my parents' party and blood flying around the room and Daddy explaining it was for laughs, the crazy SOB, and now he was saying he died of a pickled liver. I pictured the poor gasping fish and turned to drown my face in wind. But oh, what parties they danced and drank in the basement with its pole jacking up the house to the throb of jazz on the hi-fi, a haze of cigars and cocktail dresses, my mother with her chic French twist, men with loose ties and laughter roaring through the vents, the adults in their fugitive world and me and my sisters in ours, free until 2 a.m. when the house came back from the party and shrank to our dining room table with its cracks between leaves where daddy nailed his fools with a genius art, knew their true colors with a devil's eye. Secretly, I tried to let them out, poking at my lima beans to offer Bill a backbone, Fritz hair, me a slim body, light, a little more light in the lead gray room where mommy was always excusing losers when his words were stripping us, smiting the helpless lines. She tried to make peace, a thin, watery soup, not good for much, but more than the ashes that came of his scorn, a scar deeper than any I owned. But my poems also search for redemption. And this poem, I think, um, by digging, digging in my mind, in my memory, and in my emotions, I was able to come to this discovery. This poem is called Onions. The ground is winter, though the day is March. In one hand, seeds, in the other, a trowel, because when your father is dying, you're going to plant onions in frozen dirt. Onions make sense in a time of coma. Stab the dirt, claw it. Stab and claw the cold riddle begun in violence when you were small, that you papered over, hoping to hide from the others. Fool them in motley layers of self. No one could know what was down there below, quivering a naked snail. And he wasn't even your true father. But keep digging past every bitter loss, and maybe you'll find it's really God under the sheets, and your father, his heart crushed, sleeps forgiven. Well, I'm going to shift gears to something a little more cheerful. <laughs> this is a poem I wrote about my daughter, who I hope is watching. Uh, I wrote this poem for her 40th birthday and last year, and in fact, she and our grandson were the very reason that we moved from Virginia Beach to Fayetteville. Uh, they live in Valley Spring on, out in the country. 
So this is a bird's eye birthday for Katie. Did you hear the Cardinal today? The first trill after many tuneless months. You know he keeps a song under his royal red cloak to pull out on your birthday with spring on the wing. He spied your face, pretty as the sun, showing up in the yard with your boy who hops about like a rabbit, and out of the king's heart flew, purdy, 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 three notes to count like cardinal numbers. He sang to the light in your hair and to your words dancing on the run. He sang to the work you left on your desk, along with bills, which oddly aren't bills, and to laundry unfolded and pots in the sink, six books to read, a sorrow to soothe. He sang to your smile and the Lord's smile shining on the cows in the field behind the house and on the chittering sparrows and distant coyotes. But mostly he sang to your face shining in the eye of your mate who loves you, a mate with strong good looks, but not to his trophies, the deer mounts. He sang to your mother and her red hair, to which he is partial, and to the red squirrels fattened on corn, to the pair of cats and their dog who warms them at night, to the stars nesting in heaven, he sang, and sings of the seasons that were and are to come, and of the happy day you were born, carried by a breeze to the ground you stand on now and not a single feather to show for it. I like to kind of tuck jokes into my poems sometimes. Um, most of my poems um, are rooted in a sense of place uh, because none of us lives in a vacuum and knowing who we are helps us to understand, knowing where we are helps us to understand who we are. Uh, the poem I'm going to read next is called Cutting Hair. It takes in the landscapes of Virginia Beach, where I lived for about 15 years and when I was going through chemotherapy for breast cancer. So this is Cutting Hair. On the day to cut your hair, the sun has shaken its shaggy mane of light over the near ocean, over the trees behind our house after a night of hunting, after birds have refilled the trees and death has slipped into the deep woods, its memory scant as a snail's thread on the patio. I wrap you in a cape and snug it with a clip. How careful I must be, rounding your good ear with scissors, the ear my tongue loves to kiss, apricot sweet, and loves too the bad ear and its ghosts. I thread your hair with a comb to gauge length, silver in my loom. I cut your hair in rhythm, remembering the day you shaved what was left of mine, how we walked on a trail through the marsh, through tufts of fog, and I was slow as soup of low tide, slow against your arm, remembering what it was like not to lean, to be bright in my bones. I see light differently now, painting the branches behind our house early, before you're awake. It's more the gold of afterlife, I think, a glimpse before bodies take on all that death. Another place poem I'd like to read is, um, was, took place at Stumpy Lake in Virginia Beach. And um, it's called There is the Lake and There is the Street. And I need to find it. <laughs> You'll excuse me just a moment. Oh, it's in the second part. Yeah, these are different sections that I've described earlier. Um, and I have a question while you're sure. doing that, if that's okay. And anyone that's watching, if you have a question, if you just type it in the comments and I'll ask it for you. Um, how long have you been working on this collection? It seems to be like type of a memoir almost of your yeah, life. Yeah, um, most of the poems were written over a period of seven years. And then there are poems from a couple of my chapbooks that um, I wrote, you know, years before that. So all in all, it's probably been, and then some of the poems I've spent years revising. The one about my stepfather, caricaturist, gosh, I started writing that in 1991. So it's been through many, many revisions because I feel that revision is the true writing that goes on. I mean, you, you write the poem and as you're writing it, um, the poem belongs to you but after you've written it, then you belong to the poem. And so, you know, you work on be, being objective and seeing what 
needs to come out, what needs to go in. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of my process, is revision is very important. Well, I found the poem, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry for the interruption. This is called, There is the Lake and There is the Street. We left the street for the timeless green lens of water. The only signposts were cypress trees with fluted dresses who danced when our heads were turned, the way trees in love dance everywhere, who led us to longer and farther reaches of silence, past the turtle's head, the egret's curve, our paddles resting across our laps as villages of knobs drifted by on their way to the sun's slow commerce past the water striders elegant script and our need for words for memory we held it the whole afternoon that enchanted face then let it slip into the water on another day this was a cold bleak day a few years ago uh, wayne my husband and i went to uh, pea island uh, wildlife refuge in north carolina and as I said, it was kind of a dismal cold day and we walked on this really wide concrete path and I just, you know, I felt uninspired and um, wasn't really able to overcome this kind of um, gray feeling until, until we came to a vista that was quite magical and, and beautiful. And it was that that uh, triggered the poem that I wrote and got excited about when I got home. And this is called Gray Distances. The loneliness of their long whistles, the sound full of their whiteness. Even in community, they are lonely, miles of loneliness across the rain beaten water as they have come to overwinter, to fly the gray distances from there to here, to be the wings of longing, to plumb the sky and sea landing and leaving like arrows from the bow of God, the air crying for love of swans. And then um, I mentioned that some of my poems are about characters who fascinate me. And one, one named Sister Sophia presented herself to me and needed to be created. So I wrote a couple of these Sister Sophia poems um, it was W.H. Auden who said, poetry is the clear expression of mixed feelings, and I think that was Sister Sophia's problem. So this is Sister Sophia's quarrel. I'm going to step out here for a minute. What would I be if a poem born of my flesh should escape, a fish-stinking clump of words drawn from a vexed inward sea? I'll never allow it. My rogue pen my abhor rules, but I rule it within the greater order. Like the liturgy of the hours, so must my words keep faith, walk me meekly within their lines, be clean as cups on the shelf. Though Sister Ruth seems always to miss the subtle tea stains, as she at prayer is also often missing. She calls herself a poet, and knowing of my verse, appeared last night at my cell, flush-faced, fluttering. Oh, sister, permit me to read these lines. They came to me unbidden and in a white heat. Forgive my great impudence, but see how I tremble to tell you the spirit said the poem is for you. Imagine the crumb telling the loaf how to be bread. She pressed on with her shocking verse. Better honey from the rock than the rock. Better to sin, bless his wounds, than be safe. Think of the one who spurned men's commands and let a whore perfume and adore him with passionate hair, who stretched out his hand to bloom a stump on a Sabbath at that and in the presence of clergy. And then she hurried out, but not before leaving with words that worried me all night like a mouse gnawing inside a wall. It's true, Sister Sophia, art is strict as the honeycomb, but wild as love, the ecstatic honey. Well, I've been a teacher, as Corey pointed out, for decades, and I understand how easy it is to miss the mark in recognizing that each student is different and each brain works differently. 
So the next poem is called The Test, and it's dedicated to Kim, who is studying to become a teacher after deciding she wasn't cut out to be a, a nurse. So this is The Test. After hours of study and stress, she falls asleep dreaming of Thomas and the picnic. The sun's hand warms her cheeks. The sky sings its blue song. Kids are splashing in the creek, and she finds the tree with big arms and shade to eat sandwiches under, to laugh over words that rhyme with orange, feeling his eyes on her face go quiet because he sees her differently, the dark river of her hair, her kaleidoscope mind. Doubt fades in his reaching look, but she wakes to rain. The dash to the car is drenching, and the room's already full. She finds a desk in the back and feels her insides clench with an old fear that freezes the puzzles on the page everyone else is solving. And as they turn in their tests one by one, she hears them thinking, not smart enough. But didn't Thomas say, look, you think in colors, you dance your words. She zips her raincoat, turns nothing in, and shakes as she goes out the door because of what she knows she can't be and the aborning idea of who she really might be. Well, with Easter still in the air, I'm going to read um, a poem from the last section of my book called Resurrection Fruit. And it imagines, or in the poem, I imagine what it was like for Christ to suffer on the cross being crushed by the weight of sin, but also to rise up in joy. So this is resurrection fruit. I caught the fruit before they pinned me in harlequin time and ate it whole, a small ripe sun, a joy inside my ribs when the pitch black storm riddled my heart and made a riddle of souls I sheltered there. But even as I rose and sank on the bleeding tree, as the wind shrieked denials to my fraying will and the howling hills drew close to savage their spoil. I felt a current escorting me up from the fret of flesh, the faces of scorn and desire, from the wrecked earth full of bones I know will live, oh glory. How strong the ladder of your arms to raise me shivering, newborn, into jubilation bursting forever. The Anglicans have a prayer they call a bidding prayer, and that's the name of this poem. <clears throat> and I think about all the missing parts of people in wars and through uh, disease and accidents. <clears throat> so this is a poem called A Bidding Prayer. For all the lost eyes and limbs wandering over there, the severed head that made Herodias smile, and each head that darkly soaks the dust, but once nestled near a mother's heart, her luscious breasts promising, lasting, improbable love. For Robert Hanna's leg ripped with grape shot and his clumsy government issue stand in. For soldiers like him blasted and sawn, their parts misplaced in foreign lands. For minds that never stop being killed for Van Gogh's ear and his lost sanity spilling into zinnias, for poets charged with words and hung for words, for the honeycomb child dismembered from her dream and what of her golden petaled parts, for grandfather's index finger tapping a tune over there, for my missing breast so lately fondled, over there in the country of heaven the body most broken, most whole, carries the sad, unbearable bones until they're all gathered home. The last poem I'm going to read is a praise poem, a celebration of the one who freely gives and loves. It's called More Lavish Than Wisteria. Because you send apples to dance at my feet and wisteria wild in the trees to toss passionate jewels, the purple and the glittering green that awakens praise in my heart, a wick too small for such gifts of sky-sprung songs, a thousand tunes in the poplars, how can I love you back 
who fills my belly full of bread, who sent the man to be lamb sweet across my skin, and the sun's candle to waken words that rise out of sleep's gray river, to be warmed by the mist that one day will lift me high and away, how to say thanks, mere wind fleck, me? It's all I know to say to you who set me on this spinning blue now, nudging me to let you deeper in, blood of my blood, breath of desire. So thank you all so much for coming and listening to these poems. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I didn't really have any questions on here, but if anyone has one, they can comment. And But I was just curious. Mm -hmm. And I, if you comment, then I will read them to Suzanne. Um, so what really, like, what is your writing process? I know you've written quite a few collections and that's a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. You know, what is your process for writing a poem? You just wait for inspiration to hit you or? Um, well, uh, several things. Often it's an image. Um, I have a poem that I wrote about my grandmother um, called Nettie, it's in the collection. And um, she was the farming woman in Alabama. And um, so after she died, we went there, we went to her funeral. And the day we were leaving, it was springtime in Alabama and the forsythia bush was just ablaze, um, sending out these spikes of, of yellow. <laughs> And that was the shimmering image that stayed with me that led to the poem. Um, in fact, I'd like to read that one. I meant to include that if, that's, if, if I have time. Yeah, of course, please do. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's called Nettie. She went out in Forsythia, a yellow day bursting over fields once ablaze with corn and cotton, over the road buried in asphalt that leveled it, but it's still breathing underneath, pure dirt, hard as a laborer's back, a road that follows the earth's curve. The tall weeds walk up and down, singing alongside, and I was the girl walking with them, telling stories to the wind. Strange I wasn't sadder. Grandma's laughter was always wanting out, teased her mouth into a grin, but had to hold itself in for the worrisome times, and she could worry better than anyone in Morgan County. Storms, the boys running moonshine, Aunt Maddie going blind, and my mother, the beauty among brothers with fire in her mind. That morning was the last time I breathed the simple air. There's no one left to pick the small, sweet jewels of time, strawberries from her garden. Or sometimes it'll be a word. Um, another poem I wrote, I was fascinated by the word saddened, which is a technical word for when you um, are dying, um, different things like onion skins or blackberries and back in the 18th century perhaps um, and that word fascinated me and it led to a poem that I was able to write uh, after my sister died and I wrote it to her, uh, to her daughter and um, so those are a couple things I music inspires me um, works of art inspire me um, but I think it's really important um, as part of my process that you're asking about that I have to go to a place of silence um, and, and develop a, science, uh, a quiet in my own head and free of distractions. It's an intensely, it's a spiritual experience for me um, because I feel like the ground of my writing is like the stillness of God. And uh, it's from that um, and those sensory impressions that come to me and the words arise from that. Um, so yeah, and I read other, read a lot of other poetry and that certainly serves to stimulate my thinking and open up possibilities. So i I'm, my voice is quite varied. You know, I, I like to try different, I love persona, persona poems, as I mentioned, nature poems, uh, experiment with form. Uh, I just think I easily get bored. So I'm very curious and I like to, to try new things. So all the fantastic poetry that's being written um, past and present um, serves to, you know, just say, hey, that's a new idea, a new way of, of writing. And um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, if someone were trying to, let's say, get published and, mm -hmm. and wanted to try to get their collection published, do you have like a certain advice for that person? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I think it's less important to get published than it is to honor your craft and your gift. And so, um, although the submitting to journals is really important, um, because that process of getting rejected all the time uh, serves to uh, toughen you. I mean, I used to just fall apart when I would get a rejection. You know, my heart would be, and I would, you know, be in anticipation going to the mailbox, and then would be the ugly rejection letter. But those rejections, again, they serve to kind of uh, refine and kind of sharpen and and toughen. So, yeah, I think it's good to be in a writer's group at least for a while, and to make sure that the people that you're um, associating with are people that are going to be fair and respectful and, and try to understand what you're trying to do, because you can really get hurt by <laughs> people who are too judgmental or critical and really don't know what they're talking about. So there has to be that kind of understanding. So writers groups are helpful, taking workshops like what we have at the Muse Writer Center, uh, those are really great, all kinds of and now that it's virtual, anybody can sign up and they have scholarships available. They have memoir, fiction, poetry, screenwriting, you name it. But after a while, you know, so you want to, you want to make sure that your poems are as strong as they can be and then submit them to journals, do the research, find out what editors are looking for, subscribe to journals, go to the library and look at them, look at them online. And, um, and then after a while, I mean, usually the process is you need to have published in journals a certain, maybe a third or two thirds of your poems should be published before you uh, really would be able to publish a collection. Um, but then I, I have one a friend and student who um, feels like it's very easy to get egotistical about your writing and, um, and it becomes so competitive and that's really a killer. Uh, that's something you don't want. It's not a race or anything and you shouldn't be comparing yourself. There are a lot of pitfalls there to be avoided and I wrote a, um, an essay that was published called Eating the Peach, Notes on Revision that includes some of this and you can find that online probably if anybody's interested in reading that essay. And um, yeah, you kind of touched on that earlier, revision you feel like is the most important process of writing. Um, did you want to talk about that a little more? Well, I mean, some poems just come as gift <laughs> and you don't really have to do too much with them. And those are happy surprises when that happens. Um, but, you know, just being able to get rid of the excess words, uh, to take out as much as you can, um, as if you're doing a sculpture and you want to, you know, in marble and you want to chink away what doesn't present the, the central thing that you want to say. And that poems should be built on imagery and on sound. And those are the things that carry our emotion. Those are the things that um, make the poem cohere and be pleasing. Um, to me, music, the music of poetry is is extremely important, but I just hear that, you know, when I'm writing and find words that, um, you know, that really fit the uh, whole context and um, be willing to take out stanzas, save them for another poem, take out lines um, and things like that, you know, that I teach in my workshops. And I, I'm always so pleased to see, and not to my own credit, but more these are, these are just lasting principles, aesthetic principles of proportion and and um, aesthetic pleasure that is that we get um, through a well-crafted poem. So it's worth the labor. It's a labor of love. And I always tell writers who get discouraged, just keep at it, you know, don't stop and just write and don't stress over it. You know, it's supposed to be enjoyable. Um, revision can be uh, really tough, but I love the discipline of revision. Yeah, it's usually people's least favorite part of writing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, would you like to say again where someone could get your books if they wanted to? Yeah, so paracletepress.org has um, this. They're, uh, it's a wonderful publishing company. They have fine, excellent material, music as well, and many fine books. And um, the major 
you know, the major companies like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and so forth, they all carry it too. So this just came out April 1st and uh, I'd be, some people have already told me that they've gotten the book and I want to thank all of you who have done that and I, it just means a lot to me to be able to share a gift um, uh, with, with others. And we did have a few comments um, saying, Malin said that he was really enjoying the program. And then uh, Tammy said, from one poet to another, you have a beautiful way with words. Thank you for sharing. Enjoyed it. So there weren't a lot of questions, but a lot of praise. Well, that so. was nice. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I appreciate well, your hosting this, Corey, and the course. library here. At yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here, Suzanne. And thank you to everyone who's watched from home. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you.